chapter 3 of Life on the Mississippi, Frescoes from the Past. Apparently the river was ready for business now, but no, the distribution of a population along its bank was as calm and deliberate and time-devouring a process as the discovery and exploration had been. Seventy years elapsed after the exploration before the river's borders had a white population worth considering, and nearly fifty more before the river had a commerce. Between LaSalle's opening of the river and the time when it may be said to have become the vehicle of anything like a regular and active commerce, seven sovereigns had occupied the throne of England, America had become an independent nation, Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth had rotted and died, the French monarchy had gone down in the red tempest of the revolution, and Napoleon was a name that was beginning to be talked about. Truly, there were snails in those days. The river's earliest commerce was in great barges, keelboats, broadhorns. They floated and sailed from the upper rivers to New Orleans, chained cargoes there, and were tediously warped and pulled back by hand. A voyage down and back sometimes occupied nine months. In time, this commerce increased until it gave employment to hordes of rough and hardy men, rude, uneducated, brave, suffering terrific hardships with sailor-like stoicism. Heavy drinkers, coarse frolickers, and moral styes like the Natchez under the hill of that day. Heavy fighters, reckless fellows, every one. Elephantinely jolly, foul-witted, profane. Prodigal of their money, bankrupt at the end of the trip. Fond of barbaric finery, prodigious braggarts. Yet in the main, honest, trustworthy, faithful to promises, and duty, and often picturesquely magnanimous. By and by the steamboat intruded. Then for fifteen or twenty years these men continued to run their keelboats downstream, and the steamers did all the upstream business, the keelboatmen selling their boats in New Orleans and returning home as deck passengers in the steamers. But after a while, the steamboats so increased in number and in speed that they were able to absorb the entire commerce. And then keelboating died a permanent death. The keelboatmen became a deckhand or a mate or a pilot on the steamer. And when steamer berths were not open to him, he took a berth on a Pittsburgh coal flat or on a pine raft constructed in the forest up towards the sources of the Mississippi. In the heyday of the steamboating prosperity, the river from end to end was flaked with coal fleets and timber rafts, all managed by hand, and employing hosts of the rough characters whom I've been trying to describe. I remember the annual processions of mighty rafts that used to glide by Hannibal when I was a boy, an acre or so of white, sweet-smelling boards in each raft, a crew of two dozen men or more, three or four wigwams scattered about the raft's vast level space for storm quarters. And I remember the rude ways and the tremendous talk of the big crews, the ex keelboatmen and their admiringly patterning successors. For we used to swim out a quarter or a third of a mile and get on these rafts and have a ride. By way of illustrating keelboat talk and manners in that now departed and hardly remembered raft life, I will throw in in this place a chapter from a book which I've been working at by fits and starts during the last five or six years and may possibly finish in the course of five or six more. The book is a story which details some passages in the life of an ignorant village boy, Huck Finn son of the town drunkard of my time out west there. He has run away from his persecuting father and from a persecuting good widow who wishes to make a nice, truth-telling, respectable boy of him. 
and with him a slave of the widows has also escaped. They have found a fragment of a lumber raft, it is high water and dead summer time, and are floating down the river by night and hiding in the willows by day, bound for Cairo, whence the Negro will seek freedom in the heart of the free states. But in a fog they pass Cairo without knowing it. By and by they begin to suspect the truth, and Huck Finn is persuaded to end the dismal suspense by swimming down to a huge raft which they've seen in the distance ahead of them, creeping aboard under cover of darkness, and gathering the needed information by eavesdropping. But you know, a young person can't wait very well when he's impatient to find a thing out. We talked it over, and by and by, Jim said it was such a black night now that it wouldn't be no risk to swim down to the big raft and crawl aboard and listen. They would talk about Cairo because they would be calculating to go ashore there for a spree, maybe. Or anyway, they would send boats ashore to buy whiskey or fresh meat or something. Jim had a wonderful level head for a nigger. He could almost always start a good plan when you wanted one. I stood up, shook my rags off, and jumped into the river and struck out for the raft's light. By and by, when I got down nearly to her, I eased up and went slow and cautious. But everything was all right, nobody at the sweeps. So I swum down along the raft till I was almost abreast the campfire in the middle. Then I crawled aboard and inched along and got in amongst some of the bundles of shingles on the weather side of the fire. There was thirteen men there. They was the watch on deck, of course, and a mighty rough-looking lot, too. They had a jug and tin cups, and they kept the jug moving. One man was singing, roaring, you may say, and it wasn't a nice song, for parlor anyway. He roared through his nose and strung out the last word of every line very long. And when he was done, they all fetched a kind of engine war whoop, and then another was sung. It begun, There was a woman in our town, in our town did dwell. She loved her husband dearly, but another man twice as well. Singing to relu, 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 to relu, relay. She loved her husband dearly, but another man twice as well. And so on, fourteen verses. It was kind of poor, and he was going to start on the next verse. One of them said it was the tune the old cow died on. And another one said, oh, give us, give us a rest. And another one told him to take a walk, and they made fun of him till he got mad and jumped up and began to cuss the crowd and said he could lame any thief in the lot. They was all about to make a break for him, but the biggest man there jumped up and says, Sit where you are, gentlemen. Leave him to me. He's my meat. Then he jumped up in the air three times and cracked his heels together every time. He flung off a buckskin coat that was all hung with fringes and says, You lay thar till the chawn up's done, and flung down his hat, which was all over ribbons, and says, you lay there till his suffering is over. Then he jumped up in the air and cracked his heels together again and shouted out, Woo whoop! And the old original iron jaw, brass mounted, copper bellied corpse maker from the wilds of Arkansas. Look at me, I'm the man they call sudden death and general desolation. Sired by a hurricane, damned by an earthquake, half brother to the cholera. Nearly related to the smallpox on my mother's side. Look at me. I take 19 alligators and a barrel of whiskey for breakfast when I'm in robust health. And a bushel of rattlesnakes and a dead body when I'm ailing. I split the everlasting rocks with my glance and I squench the thunder when I speak. Woo whoop. Stand back and give me room according to my strength. Blood's my natural drink. And the wails of the dying is music to my ear. Cast your eyes on me, gentlemen, and lay low and hold your breath, for I'm about to turn myself loose. All the time he was getting this off, he was shaking his head and looking fierce, and kind of swelling around in a little circle 
tucking up his wristbands now and then straightening up and beating his breast with his fist saying look at me gentlemen when he got through he jumped up and cracked his heels together three times and let off a roaring whoop I'm the bloodiest son of a wild cat that lives then the man that had started the row tilted his old slouch hat down over his right eye then he bent, stooping forward with his back sagged and the south end sticking out far, and his fists a shoving out and drawn in in front of him, and so went around in a little circle about three times, swelling himself up and breathing hard. Then he straightened and jumped up, cracked his heels together three times before he lit again. That made them cheer. And he began to shout like this, Woo whoop! Bow your neck and spread, for the kingdom of sorrows a coming. Hold me down to earth, for I feel my powers a working. Woo whoop! I'm a child of sin, don't let me get a start. Smoke glass, here for all, don't tempt to look at me with a naked eye, gentlemen. When I'm playful, I use the meridians of longitude and parallels of latitude for a scene and drag the Atlantic Ocean for whales. I scratch my head with the lightning and purr myself to sleep with the thunder. When I'm cold, I bile the Gulf of Mexico and bathe in it. When I'm hot, I fan myself with an equinoctial storm. When I'm thirsty, I reach up and suck a cloud dry like a sponge. When I range the earth hungry, famine follows in my tracks. Woo whoop! Bow your head and spread. I put my hand on the sun's face and make it night in the earth. I bite a piece out of the moon and hurry the seasons. I shake myself and crumble the mountains. Contemplate me through leather, don't use the naked eye. I'm the man with a petrified heart and biler iron bowels. The massacre of isolated communities is the pastime of my idle moments. The destruction of nationalities is the serious business of my life. The boundless vastness of the great American desert is my enclosed property, and I bury my dead on my own premises. He jumped up and cracked his heels together three times before he lit. They cheered him again, and as he come down, he shouted out, Woo whoop, bow your head and spread, for the pet child of calamities a coming. Then the other one went to swelling around and blowing again. The first one, the one they called Bob. Next, the child of calamity chipped in again, bigger than ever. Then they both got at it at the same time, swelling round and round each other, punching their fists mostly into each other's faces and whooping and jawing like engines. Then Bob called the child names, and the child called him names back again. Next, Bob called him a heap rougher names, and the child come back at him with the very worst kind of language. Next, Bob knocked child's hat off, and child picked it up and kicked Bob's ribbon he had about six foot. Bob went and got it and said, never mind, this weren't going to be the last of this thing, because he was a man that never forgot and never forgive, and so the child better look out, for there was a time a-coming, just as sure he was a living man, that he would have to answer to him with the best blood in his body. The child said no man was willinger than he was for that time to come, and he would give Bob fair warning now never to cross his path again, for he could never rest till he had waited in his blood, for such was his nature, though he was sparing him now on account of his family if he'd had one. Both of them was edging away and different directions, growling and shaking their heads and going on about what they was going to do. But a little black-whiskered chap skipped up and says, Come back here, you couple chicken-livered cowards, and I'll thrash the two of you yet. 